Welcome everybody, my name is Dan Thompson. I'm Dean of Fine Arts at Studio Incominati School for Contemporary Real Estate in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I wanna begin by acknowledging the tremendous contributions of Stephen Allen Bennett and Dr. Elaine Melody Schmidt for underwriting this program, this lecture series, which enables students to better define their underlying creative perspective and that which compels them to action. Last month, I quoted from Robert Henry's book in 1923, where he talked about, quote, stimulating in students a more profound study of life, moral courage, and the study, therefore, of a specific technique and not a stock technique. A school where individuality of thought and individuality of expression are encouraged. This program and these conversations are about preparation. To reach your full creative potential, you must know history. History is you. If you want to leave a legacy, you've got to absorb as much of your own creative heritage as possible, including ideas and experiences from luminaries like Margaret. Her wisdom, her moral courage, will help you to recognize that you are not a stock individual and that proficiency of intellect is as important as dexterity with a brush. Tonight's lecture with Margaret Bolin, entitled What is Appropriation, has been revised to the issue of appropriation. I'll introduce Margaret. Margaret Bolin was born in Burlington, North Carolina. She studied at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, before moving to Brooklyn, New York, where she has lived and worked for over 35 years. She's a faculty member of the New York Academy of Art. Bolin's spellbinding and psychologically charged work brings viewers face to face with contentious culture while affirming the resilience and triumph of the human spirit. A masterful observer of life's unpredictable nature, her work conveys universal themes through unusually specific insights. Boland's work explores the subtle and nuanced edges between strength and vulnerability, certainty and doubt, faith and disbelief. Boland's probing and deeply personal images call into question our societal expectations of gender, race, and beauty. In 2011, Boland had her first New York solo exhibition, excerpts from the Great American Songbook, which traveled to the Greenville County Museum of Art in South Carolina. In February 2013, she presented her second solo exhibition, Disturbing the Peace. Boland's work has been shown nation, nationwide and internationally in group museum exhibitions at art fairs, including the Orange County Center of Contemporary Art, California, and Art Fair 21, Cologne, Germany. Additionally, in 2009, she received major recognition as the People's Choice Award winner at the Outwin Bookheaver Portrait Competition at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. She'll be exhibiting next year at the Bo Bartlett Center in 2023, something we very much look forward to. So please silence your phones and chat questions via YouTube to me. And join me in welcoming the great Margaret Bowling. Well, I will take issues with the great Margaret Bowling, but I am, good, I am very happy to be here with you tonight. Before, um, Putting together this, this talk tonight, I was thinking about what we talk about right now in my own classes with my own students at the academy. And one of the things that we talk about a great deal is um, they ask me things like, what is it okay for me to paint? Mm -hmm. That's new to me in the times that I have been alive as an artist. And I started, I was, I was educated in the early 70s. And in the early 70s, there was no such thing as figurative painting. So I was taught as an abstract expressionist at the um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I knew then that painting the figure was literally verboten. The first time I went into a class at Chapel Hill, I love many of my teachers there, Martin, Marvin, but the um, first time I went into a life class, there was a beautiful model standing on a plinth, and we were told to paint, to draw the fourth dimension, and the man left. And I wanted to know how to draw a hand, a head, Proportions. It, there was nothing, there was no education in that direction. So everybody that I know at the academy is really self-taught, certainly of my, of my generation. And we taught ourselves out of need, and I taught myself to paint from going to the Met. Pre-9-11, you could walk in on the Met with a painting in the back of my daughter's carriage, you know, a little stroller. Now, it was upsetting as hell, because I'd bring these miserable little paintings out to look, you know, to compare them to a painting that was in the room, it was an awful experience, but it taught me things that I couldn't get any other way. When I take my students to the Met, and I do it constantly in New York, 
It's to see what the paintings look like, how they are built. One of the things I carry with me from having been an abstract expressionist is this issue of texture and surface and form. When I'm look, I've got up before us right now the flaying of Marcius by Titian. There are a couple of different reasons that I have this painting up here. One of them is if I were on a desert island and was dying, this is what I would want with me. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece. It's like nothing, it's, it's a perfect painting in many, many ways. What you're seeing is a vague vision of it. Of course, it's nothing like the real piece, but when I was being taught how to paint, how to literally think about the amount of paint and air that are necessary on a canvas or on a linen piece. We would do things like take the bottom left corner of that painting and then translate, okay, how do you get the layers of the back of that man? You, if you see the piece, as I'm looking at it right here, it's a magnificent treatise in paint and color. So we would simply extrapolate that and try to figure out how to create the excitement of that surface. The reason I have it on here today, however, is I want to talk to you about this issue of what is it okay to paint. The word appropriation, which is, a, which is batted about a great deal now, comes from the Latin word appropriare. It simply means to make something one's own. It's not a nefarious term. If you, if you appropriate, if, you know, if the city of Philadelphia wants to give money to the school system, they make an appropriation so that the money is then owned by the school system. If you dress appropriately, same word, if you dress appropriately, it simply means that you are buying into a notion of what it means to prepare yourself in a way that can be understood by the body politic. She dressed appropriately. The letter was written in appropriate language for a business letter. It's about communication. That's the point of it. So when somebody says, if, you, if you're stealing from someone, that's misappropriation. When somebody says, you know these, these terms a lot, money is inert. Money is not living. So the, the idea of stealing a bag of money, eh. Language is a living thing. Art is a living thing. One of the things that all art forms have in common, all of them have in common, is the desire to create a magical space that is within the, set, the, the psyche of the artist, and that artist needs desperately to see that come to the outside. Whether it's Miles Davis, Barry Jenkins, Anybody, in any art form, Balanchine, well, Balanchine, I'm going a little far on, but any art form, what they're trying to do is create a world that lives within that artist, but you can't see it. So the magic of creating a space that doesn't exist is the common ground of all art forms. I teach a great deal from, from film because my students all feel that they have a right to understand film and they, have, they feel that they have a right to judge it. They know when a good one is going on. Moonlight is literally, Moonlight's one of the best movies I have ever seen. It's a perfect visual storytelling machine. I mean, everything about it, I will not, I don't have enough time to do that to you tonight, but it's a perfect movie. I literally require, I don't have much homework, I require that. Remember something, art painting was created to basically educate people who could not read or write the Christian stories. Before that, the, the pagan stories you've got, and it was always in the beginning art was, if you think about a Roman coin, it was to basically buttress power. You saw the old ugly Caesar's face profile on a coin, and the more you saw that, the more you believed in his power. We still do that today. We've got important people's faces on our currency. We all we completely do that. You extrapolate that, and you started with the first portraits, which were again always done in profile because the profile is the most steadfast form. They were taken from the idea of power from a coin and they were begun, they began to paint very important people. Now when it got when you got to the religious paintings, they didn't want to make highly specific, I'm, I'm back in the religious paintings came first, but they were basically to teach the stories of the Christian the, the Christian story to the people in the church. Guys babbling in front of them in Latin, they can't read or write, so they're looking around the room to find out what the heck is going on. So the artist had the brief of teaching them these stories. Now, the Christian stories, all of them, the origin myths, they are grisly. I mean, you've got crucifixions, you've got beheadings, I mean, there's not a lot of good stuff going down in those stories. So basically, I know I'm 25 words or lessing here, 
and I've got friends who will faint, but basically the language of art was created to tell those stories through beauty. And what I mean by beauty is simplified language. If you look at um, a, a person, look, we, we can do this right now. If you look at a photograph of somebody, right, and it's got kind of all, you know, it's kind of jangly and stuff, you don't have a very strong sense of it being a beautiful form. One of the things I do in my classes, which we have to teach at this point from photographs, is I say, this is a crummy photograph. Look at that shape. It looks like a smashed frog, not a person. So then we start to ask ourselves, oh, what, is that, what does a hand feel like? What's the amount of something that it feels like? You do this, you know, the, the painting by Caravaggio, Tupper de Maes, this hand is as big as this hand. In a photograph, this thing looks like a walnut. So basically what we're doing is making those kinds of adjustments, looking at the history of painting when that didn't happen, to slide that information in together and not rely so much on something that isn't a truth at all, which is the machinery of a photograph. All right, that's one of the main things we're doing with it. But one of the things that I want you to think about too here is in teaching stories, you had, they had to create a language that a simple, think of Raphael, simple geometric solid, a head is an egg, then you've got a big, big simplifications to the body so that the eye, when the eye looks at something, it initially wants to see something whole. The world has no wholeness. The world is a tragic mess. Art is the antidote to life. Art is what people can imagine. The cruel thing about being a human being is that you, have, you do know you're going to die, and you have the ability to imagine not dying, and you have the ability to imagine flying, you have the, the ability to imagine many things you can never have. Art lets you have them. And what it also does is give you a wholeness that stays put. The rest of the world is fractious. You know what it's like when you leave a, a wonderful play, when you leave a wonderful, a wonderful work of art, there's been a beginning and a middle and an end. You come out with a sense of, I went, I, when I saw Moonlight, I came out a wreck crying. I walked around the block and I went right back in. And I thought, they're, they're like an affair. You, it, it starts off great. You go excitedly into it, something goes down, and you're back out, and all you want to do is sign up again. Art is the way that the best of life gets expressed. And the wholeness issue is huge. That's why when, you have, when you're looking, I teach my students composition, simple composition. Simple composition is not endlessly difficult, people. It's about activating quadrants so that you, you basically get somebody to take a trip through a painting and come out the other side. In so doing, You've made his, his or her world feel round and whole, okay? That's your job. That's your job. We teach, talk about how to do it. It's not complicated. But when you look at the read, I know I'm going a long, a long way. My mother would say around my elbow to get to my mouth. But I'm going a long way to give you a quick backup here to get to this issue of appropriation. Let's look at the Titian, for example. Titian is making a painting about a god, Saturn, Apollo, who is flaying a fawn, flaying Marcius, who's a musician, he's flaying him alive in front of the entire, the entire citizenry of the town. This is an image, the, the Moses over here, that's taken from a Michelangelo. You've got a lot of quotations with this, within this painting where they're basically quoting power, things that were power, but look at the sadness of him. In terms of looking at this piece, though, when we're looking at the word appropriation today, he was, Titian was not a god. He was not a half man, half fawn. None of these were true facts of who he was. Who he was was an artist. And he was expressing the, the power struggle between art and power. That God is very powerful. The fact that he is literally skinning alive a man who stands for music and beauty is a cruel fact. Now, this is a terrible story he's telling you. So he made that damn thing beautiful. I tell my students the most important thing to understand about art, good art never unpacks fast. It unpacks in layers. There's a, a lizard, there's a, a nanosecond, it's not even a nanosecond. When, you're, when we walk through museums together, I, I come out one end, I say, okay, without looking back, what, where were you pulled? Because that sales point, that moment where something mattered to you, is instantaneous. It's not intellectual, it's gut, it's gut-wrenching. I've got something in my chest. It's within you, okay? 
you don't know why yet. Good painting seduces. And then you're pulled in, and then you are taught things. Now, the re way you're taught things is never didactically, by asking questions. Why is this happening? Why in moonlight? Why is Barry Jenkins switching? Why have I got a different point of view on this? Point of view. What you're doing when you look at a composition is you're teaching yourself what it says by the questions it's bringing up in your mind. And good painting will always do that if you simply follow the composition around. The beauty of that is you don't have to speak English. You don't have to speak anything. Literally, you could be mute. You can see it, and you can have an experience of going through it and coming out another side, often with a very different opinion of what's going on in the world. All right? The other reason I've got, oh, the second one, I'm supposed to do this. Margaret's supposed to do this. Switching. All right, we all know this. We all know this um, carcass of Rembrandt. Now, Rembrandt is, of course, using this carcass to stand in for the crucified Christ. This thing has been quoted to death. I'm going to throw you a few quotes in here. Why? What he's doing is saying, when you look at a crucified Christ, it's beautiful and stuff, but you don't make a, you don't make an init, a complete identification with it as a human being. When you see that bull hanging there, and Margaret eats meat, when you see that bull hanging there, you do have a much more visceral connection with the slaughtering of it. Not only are you standing there not being a Roman, not being the bad person who crucified Christ, but looking at him wonderfully, he's implicating you in the act by showing you something that you do do. That's one of the reasons it's important. But again, you come to that by asking yourself that question. Why did he do this? Why do I care? The next one is by Saville. It's quoted over and over, this, this whole thing. Mark's not that. The Saville piece is a little, um, I'm not going to criticize. I'm just saying that these are quotes one and again. Now, this one is the Bacon. The Bacon quote, this is a little bit, um, this is a young painting by Bacon. Bacon was a man who didn't have any formal education. He was basically taught by John Fowler as a house painter. He was the guy who marbleized your walls in England. Um, and he brought a lot of the same tools into art practice when he started to become a painter. And he was a wild man in terms of trying anything in the world that worked. And he was a hell of a colorist. They don't get better than Bacon. Now, this painting does not show you that so much. This painting is, he, he streamlined his work after this and became much more of a colorist than this one. The reason I've got this one is he's again quoting that carcass, OK? Then my favorite, I am Soutine is one of my favorite artists of all time. You guys know him, you better know this guy. Chaim Soutine, C-H-A-I-M-S-O-U-T-I-N-E. He's one of uh, C-H-A-I-M-S-O-U-T-I-N-E. I was introduced to his work, actually, uh, because of my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law um, would come from Cleveland to New York, and she would want to go to the Jewish Museum. And in my opinion, when I'd taken her before, it was just basically artifacts, et cetera. They had a show of Hayam Soutine's work that changed my life. I will never get over it. I mean, it was his work is so much in private hands that it's very hard to see. But if you ever get a chance, feet, feet, get there. This man's ability to take, think about the Titian we saw before. Think about how alive paint was. This is Hayam Soutine, who had no education whatsoever. The man was an Orthodox Jew. Was uh, had a very hard life. His family did not approve of anything he was doing, but he was unbelievable. The man was a natural. He's Margaret's Van, he's Margaret's Van Gogh. I, I adore this man. And to me, in this particular one, I see a man's head down and his, and his fists in this, particular depth, in this particular one. And the color is very blanched out in this piece. It's, it's different than it does. All right, this one, the next one, this is a David Hockney, where he took the flaying of Marcius and flipped it. I mean, Margaret. This is a, a Kittai. This is a portrait of David Hockney. They were friends. What Kittai did was flip the flaying of Marcius into a person who's standing and put David Hockney's head on it. What I'm trying to get across to you here is the cross pollinization that is art is the conversation that is art. Your job is to get in there and comment on things, to roll around in it, to understand it, care and find something within it that can matter to you. All right, the next one I'm going to do is a David. This David, we all know, up the wazoo. This David is the one that Kehinde Wiley took and is in the Brooklyn Museum now. Now, OK, I want to ask this. 
is it appropriation for Wiley to take Western civilization, the language of Western civilization, and use it here? Appropriation is a, it, it's, it's being used as a political cudgel right now, but it, it's, it's not a real issue, people. Appropriation, remember, means making something one's own that is a highly personal act. Insofar as when you look back, when you saw the um, painting I just showed you by Kitai, the fact that Kitai took the flying of Marcius, flipped it, and turned it into a portrait of his friend, he made that his own. He didn't steal it from Titian. You understand me? It's, it's very different. This is not, in my opinion, a misappropriation. This is someone going into power. The, the problem that, that starts to kick together is this is an usurpation of power. Powerful people, the reason I've learned to paint like I did was I wanted to paint stories of powerful people. And I wanted them not to be the people one thinks of as powerful. I wanted them to be the people I thought were powerful. So I learned the language so that I could make the people I loved powerful. I see that with what Wiley's doing here. It's a little more political in the sense that he's also making the case for a race that was not previously thought of as somebody who can command armies, although it's not entirely true. But I want you to just rummage around in this before you, you say, well, that guy's a bad person because they're appropriating something. Think it out. What does the word mean? This one's one of my favorite things in the world. This is cycla cycladic. I was told I was incorrect. This is in the Met. This is from 300, wait a minute, I've got this room now. It is from very far back BCs, yes. This is from 3100 BC. The reason that I love this piece so much is one of the first things I teach from in the Met. It's a little, it's this big and it's sitting in a glass case. One of the things I love so much about this is you've got these big simple shapes. These were fertility goddesses, one after another. It meant in every culture they had them. What I love about it, you should see this little round of flesh right there. There is a way that this, this fertility goddess is coming outside of the bounds of pure abstract shape, pure form. And she's got this roll of flesh there that has some little clink inside of you that you recognize this as a person. And in my opinion, it, it's, it's, it knocks everything over because of that. It's really quite, it's an extraordinarily beautiful piece. All right, this one is even further back. I, the only reason I've got it up here is to talk to you about basically those are the form sense. You've got fertility goddess, you've got breasts, thighs, butt. Okay, that's, what you, that's basically what you're doing. In terms of these were something that people were trying to be, you know, happy about. The harvest festival, pray to. We want, we want more babies. We want, you know, fields full of things. I'm going to take now, I'm going to go into an African mask and then quickly go into Demoiselle d'Avignon. The reason I'm doing this here is this. Picasso was not appropriating African, wasn't stealing African art. What a mask does is, by definition, annihilate the person below it. it. It takes your individual personality away. So in the, in the whole creation of African masks, they weren't created as art. I have, listen, if my house burns down tomorrow, the four things I'm going to grab out of there before my cat are my four African masks. I have, I really love those and they're important to me. However, what they, and not however, and what they were used for, and I've done a lot of research on this, is, for example, if you're in a town like Burlington, North Carolina, all right, and you don't, I'm from a little town, so, if you need judgment, and there isn't a law, uh, you know, a, there isn't a form of law in the town, the elders of the town would, in the middle of the night, put on masks, judgment masks, I have one of them, and they would come and pull you out of your house, put you in the middle of the square, and supposedly, because you couldn't see who they were, they had power, an objective power of justice over you. So they used the, the intention of an African mask was to create power that was outside the personal. You got, you got me? This isn't Mar Margaret making this up. So when... Picasso is looking at Demo d'Avignon. He's thinking, these are whores. This is like his fifth ideation of this painting. It's one painting done over another. This is him basically making a point, well, wait a minute. Women who are hookers are giving away their personhood, and they don't really want to be thought of as individuals anyway. So he took an African mask and added that to it, in keeping with the tradition of what African masks are being used for. He wasn't in any way lowering the tone 
of what it means to use an African mask. Um, these are friggin' beautiful. You see, look, the other thing you need to realize here too is simple forms are easier to make than complicated forms. They're easier to make. And they are also more easily I loved. I mean, come on, I, I love I love this. I'm gonna show you another one. I love the simple ones. So those are the ones I own. They're very beautiful and they're very simple and inside you, the way that they make you feel is again, as I was talking about, a beautiful sense of wholeness. The world may be a shit show, but man, I got this. And it's beautiful, all right? So in terms of African masks, you had Picasso going into rather complicated paintings. He, a lot of the time, overpainted an image he had with an African mask. And these were just being shown in Europe at the time. He was just discovering them. But it had nothing to do with, ah, uh, there was no comment, there was no commentary on cultures at all of that time. You basically had a free-for-all, and, and in art, look, in my opinion, once you start saying what is a proper use of imagery and not, you've destroyed art. Art must exist on pure freedom. It must. It's amoral, uh, and it's, it is. It just, the soul, it's all bellows, a, a writer I love. The soul wants what the soul wants. And there's an obsession in you to see something. And I've made a lot of things I shouldn't have made if I were trying to do something that would please people, but I needed to see it. So I had to make it. Artists don't have as much um, freedom as I think other people think about what it is they want to paint. I've got three dealers right now begging me for art, and I am 69 years old, and I'm acting like a child at home, not making art they want to make because I don't want to make the art. All right, and they don't want us. They don't want me to make the things I want to make. So it's it's a. I know, I know. I, I'm growing up a little bit here in the brink, in the nick of time, but it is true that they want me to. I understand what they want me to do. And all right, this is what Margaret did. Now this is a painting that I. This is very very old. This is 25 years old. But it was the first time that I was looking at Velasquez and his dwarfs and thinking about what that. That's the that. Miserable, that's Burlington, North Carolina right there. That little house is the house I was a child in, right behind. And I was imagining what it would be to have a mashup of people. Actually, Anna is a friend of mine who is a dwarf. I learned a lot about dwarfs and all this. She's a friend, she would pose for me, and she did this. They, the other girl, I, I tend to work with the same people over and over and over. And Claire is the bride on that side. Anna, this was one of the first paintings I did. This one is also, all right, I thought I wanted to do a group of paintings about um, Olympia. It, it intrigued me. What intrigued me about that painting was, okay, you've got a white girl lying there, and also the way that it's positioned, the way you, you, you're literally angled in that painting is as the John entering the room. You're not dead center. You're here in front of Olympia, who's hiding herself, and you're the guy. You're implicated by point of view. Filmmakers know this up the wazoo. They got it from artists, okay? They understand what they can do by implicating you in point of view. So you were implicated as the person entering that room. You see Olympia there, and you've got the beautiful black girl dressed with the flowers in the back and the cat. And I thought to myself, it just intrigued me what their relationship would be like, et cetera. So I reimagined it a lot with, admittedly, with the white girl turned into a dwarf, I know that. But I, I just imagined the power switched about what would happen if, and I saw them as women in a foxhole together, not as basically there for the taking of a man, but more there for each other. This one is another one. This was in my old studio. Oh, dwarves have a very, very hard life and many back problems. This was a, um, right after an operation that, she, that Anna had, and um, I painted her like that. Anna was somebody who did not, I was very, I was never going to paint her nude. And she actually came up to me one day after worked with her a year or so and said, why don't you ever ask me to paint in the nude? You don't think I'm beautiful? And I said, okay. Um, so I did. I, I immediately started painting her in the nude. This one is, um, this is one, of, actually, I really like this painting. In the bottom left quadrant are two different versions of, um, Olympia done, one's been, one's been done by um, Albers, and another one was done by, I'll think of it in a minute, but different people riffing on the same idea, and I just put them in the room. 
This one, another one. Um, I'm not going to push this too far. This one I like. This is the first time I ever put paint on another on a model. And the way that I saw it, when I used the blue, was the blue, I, I think I was seeing some sort of Scottish movie at the time. The blue was a warrior paint, and it was always sort of a way that you protected somebody. Paint, that kind of makeup in all cultures, was a way that you protected someone in a wartime situation in, in battle. You kept their, their actual soul hidden. And I had, this obviously is a quote from a Gauguin painting, where the, the girl's on the bed like that, and they're, the person that is Anna is turned the other way, and that person is a, um, a spirit person. I'm all the time looking at other people's paintings and appropriating their ideas over and over. Oh, uh, the other one, I should do that one. The other one is, um, oh God. This one, I, I, I don't hate this. Um, this is a painting that I did. Um, that's, I have a girl, my girlfriend who was the bride in the first painting, she has a horrible case of alopecia. She and I were, she's six feet tall. She's, she's preposterously beautiful. We go places and they, they would say, you know, my wife has cancer too, how's it going? I didn't know what it was like to be her, so I, I started to imagine her as one of those women on that bed. And what did, and most of the time my paintings are about what is it to be beautiful. This one, I, this was something that actually happened in the studio, that Kenyatta was, was putting that rose on Anna's head, and I just caught that glimpse. A lot of times the reason I paint from life is that things go down, right? You, you have somebody come in a room, and you, ha you have this idea of what you want to do, and eh, they do something much better, and then you grab that. So that one, this one was done completely by, from life, and of course it got edgier as time went on. But I, I like that painting. All right, this is a painting that um, is a friend of mine's. And the thing about this painting is I almost threw this away. Um, I basically took turpentine and just washed the whole surface. And then at the very end, I put, some, I put that white makeup on it. Really a kind of an angry act. And a, and a large part of me ended up liking the painting. This one was me working with the idea of, look, every single culture, one of the things that fascinated me was every culture whitens, every culture. This is Japanese, the Japanese geisha mark in the back of the neck. That would be the one place that they would leave flesh colored and wouldn't um, whiten. Every culture did it. In, in Las Meninas, when that, the little jar is being handed to the girl, you were the little beautiful blonde in the middle, and the handmaid's handing her a little terracotta jar. I, heard, I learned this from Vincent. It's a whitening solution. Those kids died a lot because they were being poisoned, basically, to keep them blonde and blue-eyed. The Queen Elizabeth, please, that woman is as white as me. I mean, you know, this is a very white person, but again, she was covered in white paint. Josephine almost died of lead poisoning, being covered in white paint. It was to make up some, was to erase the personality of the person and turn them into a god. Okay, now look, somebody accused me of being naive. I know what it means to put white paint on a black child. When I was in Burlington, North Carolina, I was a child in segregation. One of the earliest memories, race was the largest visual fact of my life. One of the oldest memories I have, and I'm, I've been this height since I was 11 years old, so I was little. And my dad was walking into a crummy place called Zach's Hot Dogs, talking to a friend, a black friend of his. And as we approached this miserable center block place, my dad walked with me through the door, and his friend stopped here at a door that was like a Dutch door that had a, a screen door. And my dad, you know, said bye, and he went in. And I said, why isn't um, Mr. Rogers coming with us? And daddy got very nervous about it. And, so, and then he just said, let's get our hot dogs and go. But I learned at that moment terrible facts about the fact of what he, the adults wouldn't tell you. And it, it, I talked to a German woman at my age about it years ago. Like my country fought a terrible war for terrible reasons. And it was occupied, and a lot of anger occurred. And it never, and unlike Germany, which admittedly was forced to by American money, they dealt with what happened. We never did. So it just festers and lingers for all of our lives. So the issue of what color someone is um, has been one of the largest single facts of my life. And what did it mean to be white? 
The next one, I'm going to go through these a little faster. This one is, I like playing with scale. This one's called, it ain't necessarily so, as you, as you know from the spiritual. Obviously, she's not in the same proportions that she would be. This painting is, she's much larger than life. One of the things I wanted to do with these paintings over and over is make this tiny little girl. And Jay, the reason I got I started working with Jay, I didn't pick any of this out. I was working with her sister, who is the, the woman who was the, the black model in the Olympia paintings. And Kenyatta had to go pick her up from school every day. So we would pick up Jay, we'd bring her back of her M&M's and a TV set, but she just would crawl up on the bed with Kenyatta. She wanted to be in the paintings. So after a while, I started to realize I'm being insane, and I started letting her do it. Now, the white makeup, I'm going to go through this fast, the white makeup was coming from a wedding that I was doing, a wedding that my cousin was doing. At the same time, there was a Murakami show at the Brooklyn Museum. Long story short, I imagined that wedding in the Murakami exhibition, and I'm, I don't deal in words like misogyny very much, but man, that guy, that was one heavy show. So I imagined what the idea that we all, we tell young women we want them to be as individuated as possible, but at the moment of their marriage, we suddenly want them to be white as snow. It's all very confusing to, to be a young woman in this way, and I made a painting about that. Then this one is called, um, the next one's called Someone Who Looks Over Me. Oh, I know. This is called um, the, man, the Man Who Will Love Me Someday, and someday my prince will come. In this one, I don't put paint on either of them. And that's a Kinde Wiley at the very top of a man falling. And uh, the idea, I was raised on Disney movies, people. I was raised in all this claptrap. And the same thing is, was being put on, my, on the little girls that I knew, too. The next one is a pastel. I started doing pastels. This pastel is um, someone to watch over me. It's also very large. This one is a piece that I did looking at um, Kara Walker and imagining empowerment of someone who's going to do the, make the silhouettes themselves. And those are literally extractions from, from the Kara Walker. This one, all right, the painting. This one's called The Artist. This is about Jay taking charge herself. She did put the paint on herself every time. She would never let me do it. She loved doing it. So she, she put the paint on herself. Um, nope, I don't care about that one. This one is a painting I, I love very much because we worked very hard on this. It's about the same wedding as the Murakami wedding, but this, things had gone wrong. Long story short, and I need to get this shorter, I try to put my people in danger. I put them in some perilous situation, and what I'm hoping is, that happens in the painting is that they get themselves out of it. This painting I started doing, this is a girl, this is a young woman I've known all her life. Uh, her mother is the the novelist Catherine Harrison. This painting is called 15 and 2015. And what I imagine then, I started painting money. I started literally, I know. I started literally cutting up money and making flower, I know, and making flowers out of it and lighting it on fire. And I know. Um, it was not smart, but I did it and I didn't care, damn it. Anyway, I did that. Uh, you can't get counterfeit hundreds that, look, that have the right look. So yeah, I spent a fortune on these paintings, but. Um, I like it. I like, I like that painting. They, this is a pastel. I, I just started doing very large pastels of these cotton paintings um, because they were wanted. This one is one I, I do kind of like. It's called Cotton Oil and Diamonds. And Jay loved I taught her to swim. And she loved doing that. She, she's a real athlete. And she loved doing that. When I was watching her do it one day, I just imagined what it would be like if there was something besides water dripping on her. This one is one I, I love. This is um, her niece, Kenyatta's daughter, and it's just called Doubt. It's a pastel that I, I, I feel like it, it says a lot fast. All right, this painting is, we're getting to the end of it, guys. This painting is called Nakedness Has No Color. And it comes from a James Baldwin quote, which is, Nakedness Has No Color. This can come as this cannot come as news to anyone who has ever covered or been covered by another naked human being. Very, very beautiful pin to love. And in Hindi, behind it is written that same thing. Nakedness has no, no color. The reason that I did this was I was looking at some paintings that were done by in the Deccan Plateau. The Deccan Plateau is a place where the first white people met the first darker people in India. It was a spice trade. And a lot of great art came from that. 
The reason that he's an albino, he's a good friend, he's a big model, actually. The reason he put black paint in his hands in a bucket and put it on himself. And if you look at, there's a Batman. He loved Batman. So there's a Batman insignia on his wrist. So he basically did that to himself. On where you've got, basically, I used money a lot to talk about the degradation of our ideals. The, this is a painting in which I've got, I've printed, actually a friend of mine is a printmaker, John Volk did it, printed on the canvas itself an idealized version of a $5 bill, as if that, that really did happen in a Decon Plateau um, tapestry. And then I made real ones and burned them, I love doing that, and burned them through the paper at the top. Yeah, I'm a real pyro. Um, but I, I like this painting. All right, this one is called One Child. This is a painting um, when that was cer certainly still true in China, and every single piece of money in the entire world of China has Mao's face on it. So I painted a lot of his face on that. Basically what this is about is a child being trapped in an idea of what it is to be the little princess, and she can't get out of the cage she's in. This painting is called Power. This is a very large painting about the same kind of thing. I started to do mashups of, for example, the back of this is the burning of parliament buildings by Turner. Then I fuse it to a Fragonard. I put her in 18. Basically, look, all of this is about the fact that people are born into the world and they don't know a damn thing about the conditions of the world into which they're born. They certainly don't know the history. So children are born into a world where Barbie's controlling them, everything in the world is controlling them. They don't know. This little girl is born into a world where 18th century ideas of princess outfits and white paint and the burning of parliament and what it is to be grand and all of that is going on at the same moment that she's born into the earth and she doesn't know it. All right, this one. This one is a painting called White Fives. Again, I took $5 bills, I made them into roses and I took white paint and just sprayed through them very fast. It's the same thing as putting the white paint on a girl. It's about talking about the fact that the ideals behind which we, America was built, certainly with Lincoln, are, have been completely whitewashed so that we no longer have to look at them. Um, all right, this one. I want you to look at this one. This one is Claire, the same girl that I was doing before. This is a painting of her in a bathtub, again, the girl that had alopecia. Um, and when I, I literally was painting it, and then I turned it this way, and I realized she looked, it looked like an altar. And I really loved, I really loved that painting for that. This painting is called um, Babes in the Woods. Um, this is in the Frost Museum, and this one, I basically started to imagine woods as if they were paint, paint falling from the sky. And at that, that age, there's a, a treatise on children that talks about the fact that until the age of six, they are innocent. They do not know that they must, that unconditional love is gone. They know at the, after the age of six, they know they're gonna have to do something to be loved. So for me, the, act, the fact that they are not sullied by the paint is the last moment of innocence. All right. All right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to do this one. I did two things with pastel. I did this from, um, get it out, Maggie. A negative, obviously, done from the painting. The one, this one, you can barely see, is about the same thing. It's done from the same idea. It's called Motions of Grace. This one is something I did live from um, Jay one day when she was really excited about footlights. And that one was done very fast one day in, in charcoal. And I've, I've always loved the spirit of the thing. All right, last painting, people. This is a painting that is owned by, by Steve Bennett. And it's a painting called um, 20 and 1920. The first one was 15 in 2015. This is 20 and 20. This young girl was born in, 19, in, in 2000. So what I'm looking at with this one is the same idea, all of the money that's around her head, like a crown, are, are pieces, are, you know, you've got basically, I have Cherokee blood, so uh, Jackson is not really a very popular president in my world, I'm literally not touched by um, relatives of mine. So I turn some of those 20s and burn the hell out of those. And basically put a crown, basic, it basically stands for all of the ideas that have created the world into which she's been born, wealth being one of them. She's dressed like a princess. She's incredibly beautiful. And the, her world is on fire. And I enjoy putting fighter planes at the very top, going through the top of that. I like playing with, with scale a great deal. All right, Margaret.
you're killing your people. This one is called Barbie Cake. That's me at the age of four. Um, and what I enjoyed about that, I don't know if you can see it very well in this image, is I used it like putting coffee cups down on it on a photograph to talk about the fact that, um, okay, my childhood was less than perfect. And that was, I was basically not uh, unconditionally loved, all right? I mean, people paint about their longing all their lives. Over here, my mother used to make Barbie cakes for money. We basically um, went, on, went up to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina every year on the Barbie cake money. And in this one, I imagine what it would be like if the Barbie were living persons. That's the same young woman that you just saw before. And I also thought of her as Joan of Arc. And then I also thought of the candles of that cake starting to burn into the image of me. Please let that be it. All right, this last dad gummit. All right, I like this painting, so I'm going to let this one sit here for a while. This is called, um, it's, it's from the Ella Fitzgerald thing. It's brown, black, blue, pink, it's brown, brown, beige, black, brown, and beige, pink, blue, and white. It's basically just a treatise on color, what color, what different colors mean in a world. And I love the fact that she looks very peaceful, but she's a bit drowning in that white as it keeps pouring down on her. And that's, all right, 12. 12 is, this is a poor, this is a pastel I'm very proud of. This, Steve Bennett owns this too. This is a pastel I did when I went to pick up Jay on her 12th birthday. Her hair was done in all these extraordinary, um, you know, braids. And I freaked me out because I loved her hair. So when I picked her up, um, we went home and I said, so Jay, I gave her my present and stuff. And I said, so what do you think of it? She looked about 38. And she said, I hate it. So I handed her that rat cone. And she started pulling them out. And that's what I got. This last one, Margaret's got a pleat. No, it's got to be the second or last one. This one is called um, White Crows. It's the idea of, again, I, have a, I obviously have a difficult issue with being a bride. This is being the bride as the center of what it is to be on the table. White crow is going over top of her. Basically, things are going wrong in the middle of the feast that's supposed to be talking about her beautiful new life. And this one is, um, I did white fives already. And that's it, people. Oh, God. All right, these are the last two. These are the most recent. This is a painting that I did that I'm proud of because it's, it's um, one of my little girls grown up. And she sat for me for that painting, and she was proud of it because I have a very hard time. When I work with people, I photograph, I, photo, I draw them, I photograph them, and then I come up with something. I block it from the photo, but I have to bring the person back, or I get photorealism. And she was wonderful for this. She stood there like a little princess, and it was a big triumph for both she and I. And this last one is called It's a New Day. That's, um, this is the fourth generation of little girls that come out of all this. And um, that's exactly what that beautiful child looks like. And that's all there is. OK. Now, after all of that, you're a very patient group. Um, I will take questions. Margaret, thank you so much. We're going to take some questions oh, from in-house as well as online. online. If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. I'll pass you the microphone, and that way the audience can hear the question. So go ahead, Annalise. Hey. Hi, Margaret. Hi. Um, well, you, your paintings are so layered with meaning. Does it ever bother you to think that people won't pick up on all of the nuances of your multi-layered meaning? What bothers me is the fact that they tar and feather me with meanings that aren't there. Um, listen, I have a problem, I know that, with the fact that I want to tell stories in paintings. Um, I have, a, I have a, a wonderful man, John Driscoll, was a wonderful art dealer of mine. And he would look at things like the Olympia painting. He'd say, we're throwing away four still lifes in this thing. Give me a painting of flowers. Give me, you know, please stop it. And yeah, yeah, it bothers me. But, but to be honest with you, what bothers me more is um, things that are thought about me that aren't fair. But, you know, that, that's every artist in the world, for heaven's sakes. One of the things that's true, I had, I had a person uh, denounce me a great deal, an African-American person at a show, and he said that what he got, was upset most about was that they were painted so well because that showed my elitist background. And I'm from a, 
My dad's a dry cleaner without a high school education, and my mother's a preschool teacher, and I taught myself everything, and, was, and only because Chapel Hill gave me money. I mean, I am not a privileged person. I understand, please, people. I understand that being born white in the South was privileged. I do understand that. But in terms of being told, well, it's because you, were, you had such great um, opportunity in such great schools, that hurt. And to be told, I don't like your paintings because of the color of your skin, not because I don't like your paintings. That hurts. Um, but as a friend of mine said to me, who's a very good friend, she said, listen, if you, you can't make controversial paintings and then cry if somebody gets upset by them. I mean, what kind of an asshole are you? So it's a, it's a point, and I have been extremely lucky. I've got very supportive um, collectors. God knows Stephen Bennett and Elaine are. And I've got African-American collectors who, through everything I've been going through, I got, a, I got a text in the middle of the night, Margaret, I still love you. You know, that kind of stuff. It, it's been, we're all going through a rocky road right now. And in terms of making imagery right now, we, uh, the imagery has to be emptied out a great deal to be sold. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to get through it. I, I go through this with my students all the time. They don't know what I've got to, oh. They don't know what um, they're allowed to paint. And that the fact that they're asking that question bothers the hell out of me. And then they ask me, right, who's been tarred and feathered. So it's, a, it's slightly amusing. But I am what I am, honey. I mean, you know, I, I, um, I am what I am. That's pretty much it. I know. I do know the Popeye comment. <laughs> well, actually, y'all are probably too young. I am what I am. Forget it. Okay. okay. Any, anybody else here? Let me ask you all something. Do you feel that you um, have to question what you have a right to paint or not? It's a constant conversation where, where I, I am teaching. Yeah? OK. That exposure in certain publications. In fact, Doriel Kami just had to cover up her nudes and she was commenting on it on Instagram. She said, I want to paint the female form and now I have to cover it all up if I want anyone to see it. it, it it's look, look, my experience has been this. If one can live through it, um, art is, art, art is, was rife for being exploited because nobody knows what it is. It's been, it's been, art has basically been a function of money laundering since the 80s. I mean, we all know this. So it, it's, it's not as if we can get all worked up that suddenly the salon's dead. I mean, we've been out there ready to be hijacked for a long time. And in terms of it being something that anybody can do, it is. I mean, come on. So you can say you're an artist if you want to. And it's... Um, and it's an unregulated commodity. I've had more than one guy from Wall Street thank me for that. Uh, because he, one of them said to me, even diamonds have points. And that was the thing they used before. But there, he actually picked up a wine glass. And he said to me, if Larry Gagosian says this is worth $750,000, it is. That helps me out a lot when I'm moving money. I understand all of these things. And these things we do talk about at school. because. My, my students are right before they're walking out the door into the real world, and they have to understand what's at stake. And they have to understand some of the prevalent lies that are going on now. They, ha they have to, I tell them, I tell them certain things to say, and I say, text me. You know, don't, don't just always be polite, and always say, give me a minute to think about it, because a lot of, a lot of craziness is going down. But in terms of, the only thing I can say about um, what can I paint is look at it this way. If you don't want to paint it, it's going to look like it. I'm trying to look at Soutine right now. The thing I'm working on right now is an abstract expression. You'll love this. I'm working on an abstract expressionist painting because my own daughter-in-law doesn't like my work. No, I know. It's fine. I mean, it, abstract expressionism is what impressionism was to our great-grandmothers. You know, it's something everybody likes. Okay? It, it, it doesn't... And I love it. I mean, please, Mark Bradford's one of the greatest artists alive. I mean, when it's good, it's very, very extraordinary. It's just not that much of it is that good. Susan Rothenberg, one of the, my favorite artists of all time. My God, that woman. That woman is something on this earth. So there are, there are extraordinary abstract artists. 
It's just that it is the, it is the kind of painting that asks nothing of the viewer in terms of belief system. You don't have to stand behind it. Europeans like that. They like it when you walk into their, to their salon and you mention the painting. The Americans freak out. They freak out. Americans don't, are color phobic. There's a lot of things going on. We're not educated to, to understand art. We, we don't respect it. We don't even try. So there are a lot of reasons for this. And, and one of the things that you get collectors, you do get wonderful people. Wonderful people. You don't need many. Wonderful people who come along and have your back, buy your work, and let you do what it is you can do. But it's very hard to be something you're not. It's hard. That's not very helpful, right? Yes? There are several questions from the online audience. I'm going to start with Stefani because I like what she says. There are two quotes I want to bring up. First, she says, I don't feel like I need to question what I have a right to paint. I do question myself on how best to bring out the world from within. And then she says, what's Margaret's advice on how to bring that inner world to life? Oh, that's exactly what we're always talking about all the time. Okay. Uh, one of the things I'm constantly talking about with my students is this. Um, most all of us, one of the things that artists have in common, it's been my experience, is that we all have very low opinions of ourselves. Now, I'm thinking of some men that you know, don't exactly fit that mold, but I haven't met any women. Um, basically, you have an entire core of Nazis in your head telling you every single second that what you're doing is shit. I mean, you can't even finish it before it's something inside of you is going at shit. The biggest thing I beg my students to do, sleep on it. I literally take stuff into protective custody, especially in my pastel class. By the time I go to the bathroom and come back, it's wrecked. I mean, because they won't think a minute. One of the things the abstract expressionists did, they would have six or seven paintings up at once. So they're moving with a rag for a color and they're going through, and they are not judging what is happening. They're allowing paint to happen. Basically, what a, an act of art is, is what happened, like your life is. It's not so much a directed event. Now, now listen, after you have the idea and you dredge something up out of yourself that starts to feel like an itch you need to scratch, then you have to apply a whole lot of intellectual information into how to create, to do, make that a good composition. You have to work hard then. I can't bear it yet. But in that initial, in that, you know how writers will tell you, just get it out, just write. Writing is rewriting. Same thing is true of painting, but you've got to have something to rewrite. You have to get, you have to just, you have to say to yourself, look, I'm just one girl in a room, nobody can see me, and I want to make this. And for 24 hours, I'm not going to tell myself it's a piece of shit. That's a big win. That's a large win in my experience. So to understand that to make a commun to communicate with the unconscious is a crazily difficult act. Your entire life is built. That's why people love children. That's why I paint children. I, children, they don't know any better. You know, that literally is a pirate ship. I mean, they don't know any better, so they just walk through these veils of reality. To get back to where that was, you have to fight and work hard to get back to it. And what I mean by working hard is you have to work hard at not hating yourself. You have to work very hard at believing that you have a right to be. Just being is enough. Now, I can say this stuff, people, but I am the worst at listening. But I know the things I'm saying are not wrong or right, to be going with, not to double negatives. But that's the most difficult thing. What, what I would say to this person is what she's trying to do is very difficult to understand that. I say to my students, you know, in the Olympics, if there's a 1 to 10 on difficulty scale, you're doing a 37 here, OK? Respect the difficulty of it. And then you've got a chance at respecting yourself in the attempt to do something that difficult. I hope that helps. That helps. Yes, Mia is asking, uh, she says, you have shown a majority of black models. What discussions do you have with your models in regards to racism and colorism before you decide to paint them? A lot, a lot. Um, what, what I mean by that is I painted Kenyatta. I mean, the black models, I didn't start off by painting them with any kind of 
paint on them. And I got involved um, very much in the family. And they liked putting, I mean, I'm not going to do that. Everybody tells me, I'm, 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 look, they look beautiful in that white paint to me. They liked putting it on. And I like the transition. I like the fact that it did the same thing for them that it did to all those women in the 19th century. It turned them into uh, special rich women. Now, I know that putting white paint on a black woman has a very different impact. It's, it's talking about one of the things that we talk about when I do that with them. Um, and the last one I put very little on um, is how much that really affected their lives. How much they did they hate their skin for being very dark. How many times, um, what that conversation was like in their family. Sometimes the lighter skinned cousin, I could see that even with, with Jay, the lighter skinned cousin was considered more intelligent. We, would, we talked a lot about that stuff. Basically, I listened to it. Um, I did it because in my childhood, the people who were heroic were the black people. That, that's just a truth. Now, then I do start to get nervous about the idea of, I'm appropriating somebody else's pain. I never painted anybody lynched. I never painted anybody hurt. But in painting a black person with white paint on them, I was painting what it felt like to me to be so confused about who I was and what beauty was. And one of the hardest things, long story short, my mother had a nervous breakdown when I was a small child and a black woman raised me. Now, this is a very, very old story in the South. It's a very common story in the South. Um, but it is mine too, and I knew love from this woman in a way I never knew from anybody else. And I saw her treated badly my whole life. She couldn't use the bathroom in my house. And you have to understand, I am, well, in the basement, I'm from a crummy little house. I mean, we're not talking about Tara here. You know, it, you saw it. I mean, it was just, it was unspeakably horrible. That's my childhood. That's what I remember. I remember standing next to her when she was ironing clothes and being the height of the ironing board and everything in the world about safety was being next to her body. Now, am I going to get killed for this? Probably. But that is the truth. So when I paint black people, mesmerize me. What they were able to do and triumph over stuns me. And the fact that they always were kind to me was uh, something. What I try to do when I paint, I try to paint something bad happening to somebody and them triumphing over it. Whether they're a dwarf or alopecia, or where there's something where you still see that that person is beautiful anyway. But yeah, I know. So I'd like to ask from Brooks, he says, uh, what do your models think about the paintings that you make of them? They love them. I mean, you know what happened? All right, Jay. I mean, Jay, my, my little girl that I paint all the time, one of the biggest things that ever happened to her, she lives in a very, um, even her mother's do. She lives in a very, a very large um, family full of cousins and sisters. And she's the smallest one. I think it's one of the reasons I made her so big. Long story short. Years ago, when she was at, she had a, she's from a very large elementary school, I'm the point person that the teachers called for, for Jay. And that was, that was amusing. But um, she one day, the, the huge, there was a huge auditorium where all the children are assembled. And the, the principal came out and he said, this is, we have a very important celebrity with us today. And he held up, I know, the Daily News. And it was a picture of Jay and a painting of mine in the Daily News. And this tiny little girl went up to the front to this thunderous applause. And that was just massive for her, massive. And from there, she went on. At the National Portrait Gallery, they treated her like a celebrity. She started to really, she's very athletic. I taught her to swim in a weekend in Washington, DC. And she came, she started to have an extremely high opinion of herself. Well, wait, that's unfair. A barely OK opinion of herself in which she believed she could do things. I have never had one complaint from a mother, a grandmother, anybody. They just thought it was great that the girls looked so beautiful and that people were thinking it was wonderful. Now, I 
That has been my experience. I do understand that if I were a black woman my age, I might think I was full of shit. But that has been my experience. Thank you. There are a few process questions about All right, yes. do you make a grisaille? What is your process like from All the right. genesis of the idea to the full painting, please? All right, what I teach is uh, the Rubens version of a grisaille. I don't paint a full gray picture that I then paint color on. I take people to the Met. My God, God bless it. It's sitting right there. The painting is right there, Venus and Adonis. You can literally see it built from the ground. The ground is incredibly important, people. The linen is, it need, you need to breathe. It cannot be covered up. The minute the, the linen's covered up, you've got to bend the painting. It's over. It's over. Even abstract expressionism. It's got to have air. So when you look at a Rubens, what a Rubens can do, you see very quickly he takes raw umber, very loose, you know, watercolory um, um, version of raw umber. He very quickly draws in the figure. Then he takes, I think I tell them it's like the thin relief on a dime. The, the, the paint, the lead white, is thickest where the light is hitting the form. And he ba the, the person basically, as it's going into shadow, makes it thinner so that there are no lines in paintings, people. There are just edges. So that paint gets very thin as it hits that edge. Now what it allows you to do is take a rag full of, of color, later anything you want, and just put, brush it across that thing, pull into it. Now think, the paint is going to react differently. You take a, a, a rag full of yellow transparent yellow oxide. You take it over a grayish Rubens, streaky gray ground, people. You don't want to ever knock out the ability of white to still bounce from the back. Streaky gray ground, never solid. Over that, you do this quick raw umber drawing. I know, mine looks just like Rubens. I know. After that, then you go into the area, baby Jesus' tummy, baby Jesus, you know, you, you start basically putting where the light is the strongest. And I literally take, take my thumb, remembering that I'm self-taught, I literally take my thumb and I, I smear it or push it into the cam, into the linen to get it thinner as the body is going into shadow. Now think, if you take a, a rag of transparent yellow oxide, across that many differentiated grays, you've got that many different greens. Yellow over gray is green-ish. Color in flesh is always ish, always ish. These are, these are optical colors. That's what oil paint was created to do. It was created to give you the impression that you get when you see perceptually, not directly, you know, not uh, tube paint. It was to give you these, these you know how you, you look into somebody, at, you know, and the man's got great lighting, and you can see that there's, there's a, a coolness here. Basically, we, we talk in temperature, hot and cold. Through here, if, and you guys know this, if your lights are going to be cool, your shadows are warm. Reverse in artificial light. Now, the reason you want those to be consistent is because they work on, on the person um, like a map reveal. Even without you, you think, you know that's what it means. So even if you, you're just feeling it, you're not thinking those thoughts, it has a whole way of feeling, it has a way of feeling unified to you. And the colors that you create, like, oh my God, there's a Picasso, my Lord, there's a Picasso I, I teach from in the Met. There's 38,000 blooms in there because he's got, he's got a scrape, I mean, probably two things on the palette, but the way he scrapes through one, lets the raw umber interact with another one, he's, he's a painting only exists in itself. It doesn't exist outside anywhere. It doesn't exist on your palette. So what the blue is doing when it hits the canvas is unique. And the way it scrapes into another color is unique. It doesn't have a parallel existence out here. That's why it's exciting. And that's why it's, the paintings are unique. And that's why one feels different to the other. And that's why there's air in them. I, I don't know what I said. That is why there's air. Air is important, people. You gotta remember that. When you're in a museum, you can't see this on these things. When you're in a museum, look to the ground. Ask yourself, where's the ground? Where's the linen showing through? Ask yourself how much Gainsborough, there's great Gainsborough, and I know great Gainsborough in the Met for this. Where you see the encrustation on the dreck of the white lead and basically a brush spread back into it to give you the idea of, of embroidery. The paint, there's a tablespoon of paint in the rest of it. And there's no paint. There's just a, a thin rag movement because insofar as you take a very thin application of oil paint and put it over top of a ground, you've got 200 yards, 200 miles. The difference in that 
and where you have impasto, where the paint is coming over top of it, is the history of oil paint. And it's right there in front of you. I mean, literally, I taught myself as far as I know how to paint from looking at that work. That's right there. But I don't do a gray painting and paint on it. That way lies death. You're always going in, in a Rubens, you know, you've got the gray, you've got the white. Remember, these, this stuff used to dry overnight with these people because they didn't have all the spillers in it. You know, Luigi made it every day, right? So Curran does this. He has different little, he has a date on it. Like, which one was that ground so this one's a little thicker than the next? So by the time you get the white against the gray ground, that is the grisaille. You get me? Not many admixtures of gray. You, I do some, but not a lot. And then you immediately start going back into color. Remember that there's, it's not like one, two. You do that, and then something sinks too much, you've got to go back with the white again. It's back and forth. You understand? That's the biggest thing I, I try to get across there. It, it's not one, two, ever. But it's, if you think about... You can see it in the painting. I mean, when something flattens out a little bit, you go build it back up a little bit. You let that dry, you do it again. You just keep moving with it. But you try to let as much air and the original, oh Lord, in the Rubens I'm talking about, you can see the line of the calf, and then you can see where he corrected it. And it's just like, it's so exciting just to see him think. I mean, think of what that is. You know, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. It's very exciting. All right. Yeah, there's, there's been some questions about how much should realist painters, this being a realist school, be aware of their art history. And I think you're speaking to that in the Rubens description and other things, right? The sort of technical yeah. insights that you gain. How, that how, much, how much should a realist painter be aware of what? Their art history. Oh, good Lord, you have to. I mean, remember something, people. I've got students who don't know who French are. I, had, I actually had a student write down, Bosch. The thing is, since we, all my, everybody knows everybody um, on Instagram since last Thursday, people, but remember a couple of things here. What you're seeing on a machine has a friggin' light behind it, okay? Your paintings don't, A. Eh? And B, all of the forms, including mine, all of the forms are flattened out here. You're not seeing any of the things I'm talking about in terms of form. You must, the reason people live in, the, in New York, and you've got a great museum here, the reason you pay money to live in cities, in cities, in my personal opinion, is to get near art. You can see real art. It's a huge deal. You go there and you see it. And I, I take students there. They immediately get it. I mean, immediately get it. It's, it's like a cooking show where I'm, I'm showing you how to whip eggs. Think about what it would sound like if I wrote that down. If I show you how to whip eggs, fold them into a souffle, you got it. You see the difference in the souffle and something flat. It's, it's that simple in terms of understanding what is necessary, but you have to see it to understand it. But it's immediate if you do. It's immediate. Go to museums and look at good paintings. And we, do, we are lucky here. We are lucky between the Met. Also, we've got some crummy paintings in the Met. God bless them. So you see right in the middle something that's not working. And my students always see it immediately. It's really wonderful. Ask one more question no, uh, from the him. from the you virtual audience, patient. which is, uh, I mean, it goes again to technical facility and uh, it, essentially to finish to finishing up a painting. Can you talk a little bit about what how you resolve your pieces because they many of them are so highly resolved. They're great textures. It's very, I mean, it's very complicated. I'd like to hear some of your insights. Also, you work in pastel versus oil at times, right? Yeah. Um. <laughs> I shouldn't say I quit. It's a little bit like that. Um, well, all right. In this little painting, that, it's not the best thing I've ever done. Okay, in this one. I resolved this painting when I looked into the, um, this over here, this, I mean, I had that on a dummy, I mean, this little outfit on a dressmaker dummy, and I realized I needed the shadow of her head to fall on that thing, or it wasn't going to give me any sense of going all the way around it. I go back through and look for things like that, like where's the form not feeling round? The other thing I tell all my students to do is this. This is an easy one. At the end of the day, you know, you're scrambling just to do something. End of the day, look back and see where your brush marks seem predictable. Can I see five inches, five inches, five inches, five inches? Just no. You rag it out. If an edge, if a line in paint, if an edge in paint feels too heavy, the last thing I do every day is smear it out. Oil paint will hold hard, and it's a bitch to move. 
You give yourself room to fight another day. Make sure that you keep, that you stay attentive to letting something new happen. Because the most exciting things that happen in a painting are not the things that are predictable to you. They're not. I mean, I'm looking at this painting, I'm feeling, anyway, they're not. So you, you basically, in resolving a painting, need to know that it's going to surprise you. <laughs> right. I know how much I'd love it if somebody said that to me, but, but that is the answer. Thank you. One more. Yeah, I would. I have to read it off my card. It's okay. For one, I'm worried that my paintings won't be complex, complex psychologically. So I'm wondering, what is your conceptualizing process? How do you organize your thoughts and composition so they're able to represent and communicate all of the concepts you want to say simultaneously? And yeah. how do you, like, how long does it take you to decide what you want to say and then? I think that's a very good question. Thank you. Because it varies a great deal. One of the thoughts I have is that um, every time I take students to the Met, when I walk out the door, I say, okay, what's the thing you remember the most? Not one person ever says a Poussin battle scene. No one. <laughs> I mean, not in the history of the world. I mean, not, not to try to denigrate them. You did wonderful things. But nobody says that. What they are trying, what they remember is something really, really rather simple that mattered to them. Um, in terms of my extremely unedited and overpacked paintings, I end up doing something like I like something. The, little, the painting of the little girl going like back like this with the roses all around her. She was in an entirely different pose. And she went to the bathroom. And Jay was a very queenly person. I mean, she's, she's a born aristocrat. I mean, nothing. She always moved like this. And I said something to her, and she was like, what? And when she did that, and her hair, that was also when she was taking those ringlets out, her hair was coming down her back, like in those old paintings of, of women with the big hair, and then the, the, you know, good Lord, you know, 18th century women. And I thought, damn, I want that. I had no idea where she was going to be. I just went with the idea, OK. This is a queenly pose. I need to see this. And then I thought, where is she? Then I started to think about, um, I was working with a lot of those roses thing, and I was started to think about painting the roses red. The, the, the best treatise on, she was becoming 12. And the biggest, best, still the best written treatise on puberty is um, Alice in Wonderland. And one of the things about it that's so extraordinary is that, remember, remember the moment where the queen is running around saying, She's going to cut the heads off of all the guys who painted white, who planted white roses because only red roses would do. There is no more insane thing in the history of the world. There's not a better, red roses aren't more beautiful than white roses, for God's sake. It was just another insane thing of red better than white. And what happened in the, in the act of painting red on the white roses, they all died, of course. So that idea, when I was thinking about what, what a child trying to, under, trying to go into this world, it's horrible. It's just like Alice in Wonderland. You're too big, you're too small, you're not the right person, you're not in the right place. So I had her, and there were barbed wires. I, I started making the, the stems of the roses I was making out of barbed wire. So she looks like she's walking into one of those glens, like in an 18th century painting. But if you look at the painting closely, there are barbed wires everywhere. She can't get through it. So she's set up for failure. But who came in this in bits and pieces? I mean, being serious. I mean, have I ever had a painting? Wow. I don't, wow. That is actually the way I work. That's the truth. I mean, I was just asking myself, well, come on, Margaret, you're bound to have had an idea before. Um, it's vague. It's vague. Like, I'll have people in the room, and I'm going to do something with um, Olympia. So I got a black girl, a white girl, and some black animal. I had dogs sometimes, a cat sometimes, and flowers. I murder likes to paint flowers. So, um, but then I look, I see what happens between them. I know it's expensive to hire two models, but it, I, make, I do ask them, and they do it at the school. What two people do with each other is not the same thing as collaging two people together. It ain't. There's a whole lot that goes on when people move together, and that's what you want to see. So basically, honey, what I do is get people in a room and uh, run after them, watch and see what happens, and um, that's the truth. It's pretty lame when I actually put it all out there. 
<laughs> but what I, but it is the truth. And when I'm, I basically go after something I'm loving, you know, and I have to see it. And then that happens. Wow. <laughs> I've got friends, I've got some very intellectual male friends who would just faint. But we're different. I guess it's one of those things when you're looking at something, you think it's the pinnacle of genius because you don't really understand what goes on behind it. I don't, baby, I don't ever. Think of it this way. I am 69 years old. I never know. So in terms of you hoping, I used to hope when I got older that, uh, nah, it's not improving. So it's, it's basically, but look at it this way. It is the thrill of it. Um, the, whoa. I mean, the thrill of it, I don't know until it's over. And sometimes they're, you know, they're not very good or whatever. But um, and sometimes they'll lean on another one. You know, I'll have done this, and then I'll think, well, maybe. There are interconnectedness, of course. But I don't, I hope none of my students are listening. I, I always ask them to give me these sketches that then we're going to, and I don't do it. I have an idea or a sketch of a painting, but I don't know all of it ever, ever. My advice to you is um, go with whatever it is you need to see and just trust that. And for God's sakes, know that you are your absolute worst enemy. You know, every, there's a big joke. I'll, I'll end with this. A big joke. The only thing worse than having a show is not having a show. I, I, because the opening is just hell. You go in there and the only thing you see is just how awful everything looks then you have to tell yourself, don't drink. It's a working night. <laughs> so it, it's, it's just agony. And then people are coming up to you and saying, and I, and I school my kids in this, they're coming, oh my God, this is a genius, you're wonderful. And your thought is, you just don't know shit about art. But you do not say this to the person who is saying nice things to you. You try to maybe see it a little bit through their eyes. Every thing I'm doing when I'm teaching is I'm saying, Lauren, if you could just see this through my eyes, we have a different game. And I'm not wrong about that, honey. You are um, not your best critic. So try to be your best mother. A mother would never say to her daughter, well, mine would, but a, no, a decent mother would never say to her mother, her child, this isn't going to work out. They praise everything. And that's what they should do. If you could just mother yourself a little bit, like a good mother, and say, you know what, we don't really know where this is going to go, but this is a good day's work. That will add up to something. That child will succeed. The one that gets beaten upside the face every day won't. And then you may be leaning a little more in that direction. OK, folks, you've been a very, very patient. Thank you very much. Margaret, thank you so much. You, it was fantastic. We're huge fans. We hope you come back. And thank you all very much for joining us this evening.